City Gate, put your hands together and welcome our Lebanon campus that is joining us right now. Lebanon, so good to see you. Good Sunday morning to all of you there in Lebanon. We love you and we thank God for you. I'm excited to get into this series through the month of May entitled The Spirit and the Bride. And I've entitled the message just that this morning, The Spirit and the Bride. If you have your Bible, hold it up. Hold it up. And I want you to shout, I want you to shake the rafters in this place here and at Lebanon. Shout it with me. Be it unto me according to your word. You can do so much better. Are you ready? Be it unto me according to your word. Now give him a big praise. Some of you already forgot to bring your Bibles. My goodness. Open to Revelation. Go all the way to the end. Revelation chapter 19. And go down to verse 7. The revelation of Jesus Christ to, to John is such an interesting book. In fact, there is something spoken about this book that is not spoken about any of the other 65 books in the Bible. Revelation is the only book that has a blessing on it if you read it. It actually starts by saying, blessed is the one who reads the words of this book. No other book, think about that, 66 books, not one of the other 65 books say you're blessed if you read this. Now, I do believe you are blessed if you read them, but this is the only one that commands a blessing when you read it. How many are thankful that the Bible doesn't say you're blessed if you understand it? Thank you, Lord. You know, the dragon's got six toenails and, you know, three eyes and all this kind of stuff. I, I, don't, I don't understand it all. But I'm just thankful he said you're blessed if you read it, not if you understand it. Let's go to 19, Revelation 19, verse 7. Here's what your Bible says. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why don't we try that right now? Give God all the glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. The wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Revelation chapter 22, go to the right, final chapter, verse 17. We are just a few verses away from the end of the entire Bible, and here's what it says. The Spirit and the Bride say, Come. And let the one who hears say, Come. And let the one who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires to take the water of life without price. Now let me talk about that water just for a moment. He says it's without price. How can this water of life be without price? It's already been paid for. And so now you and I get to come and drink freely from the water of life. But I want you to hear this cry, the cry of the Spirit and the bride together in unison. They're crying out to the bridegroom, even so come Lord Jesus. They're ready for his return. Father, bless the reading of your word today is my prayer. Don't let these just be words, enticing words of man's wisdom, but let there be a demonstration of the power of the Holy Ghost. Make this come alive inside people's hearts is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, this was a tough, I'll just be honest with you, this was a tough message to begin. It's, a, it's not often that I, I study so much that I really don't even know what to preach. There is so much about the spirit and the bride working together, calling out to the bridegroom. 
There was so much to talk about. I didn't know where to begin, but then I came across this story, and I wanted to just kind of summarize this story for you that I read. It's the story of a peasant bride. A more intriguing romance has never occurred. This prince's attraction to this bride is baffling. He is a stately prince, royalty, wealth without measure, power without measure. She is a common peasant. She's not ugly, but she can be. And often, she is. She tends to complain a lot, gripe a lot, a lot of self-loathing. She can even be cranky. Here's the big idea. She's not the kind of person that you would want to live with. No men said amen. I think I get it. But according to this prince, she's the one he can't live without. So this prince goes to her little village one day, goes to her home with dusty floors, abject poverty, looks at her stained, tattered clothing, her messy face. He gets down on one knee and he proposes to her on the dusty floor of her peasant's cottage. He kneels, he takes her by the hand, and he says, I want you to be my bride. Now, what do you think she's going to say? Absolutely, yes. I have nothing to offer. You have everything to offer. Absolutely. She said, yes. He said, there's only one thing. I have to go take care of some business, but I'll return for you soon. I promise you. And she responds, I'll be waiting. And no one thought it odd that a prince would have to leave. He is, after all, the son of a king. What's odd is not his departure, but this woman's behavior in his absence. See, somehow she forgets that she's engaged. You would think the wedding would be on the forefront of her mind, but it isn't. You would think the day would be on the tip of her tongue, but it's not. Why, some of her friends have never even heard her speak of the prince or that there's a wedding. Days pass, even weeks, and his return isn't even mentioned. Why, there have been times that she's been seen on the streets talking with other men of the town. She's even flirted with them whispering in their ears and she's doing this in the bright of day I don't even want to think about what she's doing in the dark of night is she rebellious maybe but mostly she's forgetful she keeps forgetting that she's engaged now if you haven't caught on yet this isn't a fairy tale this is a story of Jesus Christ and the modern day church. We had nothing to offer him. He had everything to offer us. He stooped down to where we are, came to the dusty floor called planet earth. He looked at our tattered clothes and our messy face. He looked at a woman, he looked at a bride who is cranky and obnoxious and self-loathing and complaining and can't get along with anybody else. Who may not be ugly, but often is ugly. And yet, despite all of that, he couldn't take his eyes off of us. And he says, all I can imagine is eternity with you. I can't imagine eternity without you. And I'll pay whatever it takes for you to be my bride. But he said, I got to go and I got to take care of some business, but I will return. And in his absence, haven't we been flirting? Haven't we been whispering with the world? Haven't we had eyes for everything else but him? 
How many of you have talked about the rapture? How many of you have talked about the coming of Jesus Christ? How many of you have told anyone you're even engaged? I don't know about you, but when I put that ring on Kim's finger, I wanted everybody to know about it. I proudly walked around saying, she's going to be mine. She's going to be mine. And she did the same thing. I don't know how I would have felt if when Kim went out, she put her hand in her pocket so nobody saw her engagement ring. But you put your hand in your pocket at work every morning because you don't want anyone to know you're engaged. You don't want anyone to know there's a wedding on the way. And we wonder why the bride is acting like it's acting today. Listen, let me just say something real quick. Can I make it plain? I know there are people that want me to stand up here. And there are times I will, when the, when the Spirit leads me, when God leads me, I will address some things going on in culture. But there are people who want me to stand here every week and have a political rally and tell you how bad the world is and everything going on with the world. Folks, here's a big idea. The world is supposed to act like the world they're supposed to be confused they're supposed to not be able to figure out whether they're a man or what I get all that that's how the world's supposed to act but not the church we are engaged we are engaged the, the, the bridegroom is coming and we ought to be telling everyone you can have a seat at the wedding if you want to you're invited the world should act like the church, but the church should act like we're engaged. Can I, can I dig into this a little bit deeper? The picture, picture of marriage is found throughout Scripture. This is the greatest image that God uses to express the love that Christ has for His church. In fact, when God wanted to describe who He was, He used a husband and wife. He said, let us make man in our own image male and female he created them that's the first marriage so if you even want to understand who god is you have to understand marriage and all through the bible this is just one big love story about somebody that he betrothed himself to who walked away from him and he spends the rest of his book trying to get her back. The summary of the entire Bible, I know it sounds weak. I know it sounds overused, but you, you, you just can't improve on it. It's a four-letter word. Love. <laughs> Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He who loves not does not know God, for God is love. And when you look at the way that a Jewish wedding would have been set up and celebrated in ancient times, even today, and you look at some of the phrases that is used throughout scripture, you will realize that we had a misunderstanding of some of the scriptures and verses that we've been quoting, that these were actually wedding verses. Let me explain it to you. A Jewish wedding begins like this. It's a period of time called the arrangement. The first stage involves a groom leaving his father's home. He travels to the home of his future bride. And once he gets there, he lets her know that I've chosen you. John 6, 38. Jesus said, for I've come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. When he finds the bride, he must pay to purchase the bride. It's called a bride price. The value must be made known to the bride that is being purchased. The arrangement that you and I were purchased under was sealed with blood. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. That's a wedding scripture. And here's the big idea. The more expensive something is, the bigger the payment required. How much did this bride cost? It cost Jesus Christ his life. He gave his last drop of blood 
to purchase this bride. Here's another idea. The wife can only be acquired with her consent. You can't force the bride to marry the groom. She has a choice in the matter. And it doesn't matter how often Jesus visits you. And it doesn't matter how many times he says he loves you. If you don't choose him, he can't take you. From that moment, the bride, I love this. From that moment, she is sanctified. She is set apart. She is exclusive for her bridegroom. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without having spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. Stop trying to blend in with all the other women. Stop trying to blend in with the rest of the world. You have been called out. You have been sanctified. You have been made holy. You have been set apart. Go to a wedding. Who stands out? All us groomsmen, we all look alike. That's so if the groom drops dead, the next one just steps on up. But she stands out. The church is supposed to stand out. There's supposed to be things about us that are different than the things that are in the world. The world may fight and carry on and divide and not get along, but that shouldn't be happening inside the church. The world may push racism, but in the church we push unity. The world may push cursing, but in the church we push blessing. The world may push debauchery and adultery, and for, but in the church we preach holiness. I love this. Then there is a period called preparation. So what does the bridegroom, the bridegroom do in this time? Jesus was, he was trying to show us, but we got so caught up in saying this at funerals, we missed that he's actually talking about a wedding. John 14. Let not your heart be troubled, neither be afraid. In my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But as the bridegroom, I go to prepare a place for us to live after we're married. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. This is wedding talk, folks. Because it was the responsibility, let me talk about this for a second. It was the responsibility for the future groom to prepare a place for his wife to live. Can I just say that one more time? And can I just get a little more surface level with it? Can I go shallow? I just want to go shallow. Just let me go shallow just for a moment. It was the responsibility for the groom to wake up and get a job and move out of his parents' basement and prepare a place for his wife to live. Well, the groom prepared the place. Now back spiritual, come back spiritual. Folks, y'all went carnal on me just like that. Come back into the spirit. Your bridegroom is right now preparing a place. He's been working on it for over 2,000 years. Can you imagine what your home is going to look like? If you spend over 2,000 years building a house, how great is this house going to be? Oh, let's go a little bit deeper. During the preparation or the betrothal stage, what security does the bride have that the bridegroom will come again and fetch her, capture her,
take her back to where what promise does the bride have that he's coming again Ephesians 1 14 the Holy Spirit is the down payment on our inheritance which is applied to our redemption as God's own people resulting in honor the honor of God's glory I don't know if you heard what I just said the Holy Spirit is the down payment on our inheritance the Holy Spirit what, what, what were you re when you bought your home what down payment were you required when you bought a car what, what down payment were you required what are they what are they charging for homes now is it 20 percent 20 percent down payment 20 percent okay so 20 percent that means that means there is 80 percent of value that's not been realized yet You've only seen 20%. <laughs> Hold on. You got to flow with me just for a second. Come on. I'm trying not to go Pentecostal up in here, but I've just, you just got to just give me a second. I want you to think of the greatest service you've ever been in. I want you to think of the moment when the Holy Spirit filled the room till you felt like you were levitating off the floor. Miracles and signs and wonders breaking out. Joy exceedingly overflowing, full of glory. Think of those moments where you could not even stand up under the weight of the Holy Spirit that was in the room. And that was just 20% of what heaven is going to be like. That is only 20%. That's just a down payment on your inheritance that is waiting for you. This is why the world around us ought to be able to look at the church and see a foreshadowing of what heaven will be like. I hope it gets loud in here. Why does it got to be so loud every Sunday? Can we just... just Tone it down a little bit. This is only 20% of the volume in heaven. You think it's loud here? Wait till Jesus cranks it up by 80%. See what I'm saying? You think, you think the dancing is crazy here? Wait till the party gets started up in heaven. You think the joy is overflowing here? Wait until the joy that's flowing when we get to heaven. So every experience with the Holy Ghost is a taste of heaven. If you've ever felt him touch your life, what he's showing you is, wait till you get to heaven. Woo, did you feel that? Wait till you get to heaven. So why do I want Holy Ghost moments like we experience in here? Because it makes me hungrier for heaven. Watch, watch. Whenever there's been a great move of God, People did not cry out, heaven come to earth. Whenever there was a great move of God, people started talking about going to heaven. Because whenever you experience the Holy Ghost, he doesn't make you fall in love with this world. He makes you fall in love with heaven. Because that's where you're going. And so he makes you hungry, and so you start calling out, and people start writing songs about, and we don't talk about going to heaven anymore. Why? Because we got eyes. For this world joy laughing the resting the dancing the praising and it's just a down payment on things to come I've got to go quickly and then you got to get dressed for the wedding get dressed for the wedding it's it's the wedding is really just just it, it's about the bride. It's about getting the bride dressed. The focus is on her and getting her ready. And that beautiful gown when she walks out. And, and everyone can see that there's something different about her. Jesus said this in Luke 24, 49. Don't leave Jerusalem until you be clothed with power. What he's saying is, don't walk out without your clothes on. This is the Holy Spirit. When you experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, not only does the Holy Spirit fill you up on the inside, he clothes you with power on the outside. I'll talk about that more in just a moment. 
You have, I love this, you have a new name. So when I married Kim, her identity changed. She got a new last name. She's now a Petri, whether she likes it or not. <laughs> she took on my name, which means that she can now, I don't know how I feel about this, she can buy things in my name. She can access things that are in my name. And if they say, I'm sorry, you're not Eric Petrie, she takes this little certificate and says, I married him. We are one. I got his name. And they say, okay, you've got access. You've got access to his funds. You've got access to his accounts. You've got access to his inheritance. Anything that belongs to him now belongs to you because where you were two, you are now one. And he's even given you his name. She didn't give me her name. I gave her my name. And Jesus says, anything that you ask the Father in my Did you just feel the Holy Ghost come into the room? I just, I just felt the Holy Ghost step into this room with power. Hallelujah. I don't know if you feel that at Lebanon. I don't know if you feel that online, but the Spirit of God is in this room. Anything you ask the Father, don't go in your name because your name has no power. But you have been betrothed to the bridegroom, and the bridegroom gave you his name, and with his name came all of his inheritance. Now everything that belongs to him belongs to you, so you can now boldly go before the throne of grace, and you can say, I'm not standing here in my name. I've been married. I've been married to the bridegroom. I hold his name. I'm bought. I've been bought with a price. I want someone right now, I don't know what you need God to do in your life, but I dare you just to ask by faith in the name of Jesus and believe that anything you ask the Father in Jesus' name, he will give it to you. Healing, deliverance, salvation. Dreams, jobs, freedom, freedom from bitterness. Ask the Father. Not in your name. Your name doesn't have power in his name. You've taken on a new name, a new identity. You have been clothed with power. You have been clothed with power. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Right now, just welcome the Holy Spirit into this room. Just welcome the Holy Ghost into this room. Right now. He loved you enough to give you a down payment called the Holy Ghost. He loved you enough to give you a gift to seal this arrangement called the Holy Ghost. Have you received that gift? Have you received that gift? Thank you, Jesus. Church, worship him in this place. Because I'm telling you, he's here right now. He's here. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Just realize what some of you are feeling right now is just a taste of what heaven's going to feel like. What you're experiencing right now is just a taste of the inheritance that is to come.